Hello, it's the IGN UK podcast. Daniel Krupa's here. Hello. The other fella's here. Hello. L- Luke Kamali. I forgot you. Do you know, I actually forgot your name for a split second. The other fella in an office of five. Yeah, that's fine. That's <laughs> not fine. bad. I'm, of course, Stuart Reed. It's heavenly to be back. Uh, this is podcast number 225. 225 of these melon farmers. Uh, and I think out of 225, I think we've done, what, seven, eight good ones? <laughs> it's not a bad average, lads. Come on. No, it's true. Yeah. Be fair. We're um, not allowed to do them together anymore. No. Usually. <laughs> they have to break us into little teams <laughs> so we don't run riot. I'm a bit concerned that Luke and I are back together for the first time since the chaos. Of 221, I believe it is. I think it was. The <laughs> legend, legendary 221, Luke, as it's known. A podcast I have that live in infamy. I have a tattoo on my... In infamy. On my penis. Do nice. you really? Yeah. Oh, Good. Luke, you didn't take you long to bring that uh, up. Well. We are going to talk about scary games and scary films, and we are going to read out read a feedback is this um, the musical episode yes, I really dear one. god I hope not this is what the other one was feet. like yeah, right, was right no let's get back on, tra- all over but again. Before, back on track let's get on with the news 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 news, news Daniel news. Krupa's got news about a video game person <laughs> yes this is about um, <laughs> yeah video game person this is about Justin Richmond who was the director working on the PS4 iteration of Uncharted mm. and he has now left Naughty Dog this week why? He says, I have in fact made the decision to leave Naughty Dog. I love the company and the people and know that they will continue to create awesome games going forward. On a happier note, after careful consideration and exploration, I've enjoyed Riot Games. There is some he's really... He's enjoyed what? He's joined Riot Games, sorry. Oh, the guys who there made is some like, uh, re- League of Legends. Yes, yeah, so there is some really innovative stuff going on here and I can't wait to be a part of it. Hmm. What's the problem here, though? Because, well, you know, it, he was making Uncharted 4. Yeah, and, and this that's, comes that's very, a pretty big game. And this comes very shortly after um, creative director at Naughty Dog, Amy Hennig, um, departed as well. Um, Sony, she was the writer, right? Yeah. Sony, w- yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting because both, both these people were name-checked by Sony when the project was announced. Like, Amy's working on it, Justin's working on yeah. it, and now they've both departed before we even really have a proper reveal for the game. And that was announced, what, VGX Awards, which mm. was November? Yeah, so mm, mm. people mm. don't tend to walk away from things they're really happy or enjoying or proud of. And it comes off the back of the fact... <laughs> Just putting that out there. But it comes yeah. off the back of all these other layoffs, right? There's um, Workplace the, bullying. Workplace bullying. Right. Uh, of stuff in... You know, um, Sony evolution. Elsewhere. Yeah, but uh, drive club developer. But of all the Sony developers, not to suffer from layoffs. I don't. These are not layoffs. These are these are walk-offs. These, these, these are walk-offs, yeah. Dan. It, yeah, nobody's laying down. This it's is like the Huey on uh, Never Mind the Buzzcocks. Yeah, they, he's, they're, 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 she's they're smashing the, the cup. Mug. Yeah, are they are they dropping the mic? Uh, let me just check. The story or do you have to details. complete something new, before you can drop the mic? New. I don't think so. No, you no, can drop. You, you, can, you can be attacked by having attack so the vapors and just not to the vapors. <laughs> Shut my goodness! Stop it! Back on back on track. Yeah, yeah. You need to keep this to fifty minutes, not good. four hours like no. last time. Jesus <laughs> Christ! Is it really? Anyway, well, it really focus, yeah. focus. Come yeah. on, get on with um, it. That's it, really. Move oh. on. Oh no, really? but I, I don't want to like. Let's not like overreact about it. But it is definitely a note of. Do right. we know who the project <coughs> is now in hands of? In the hands of? Nah. Well, there's talk about um, Neil Druckmann and Bruce Straley, like. But they're, they're around named, it, they're but I just everywhere. assume they're working on a follow up to anyway. Um, whatever. Hey, it's just a little reason to be a little bit concerned about Uncharted. Well, uh, uh, Justin Richmond, well, did, did he work on the other Uncharted? Is... Yeah, in different capacities. So he oversaw right. um, multiplayer yeah. on Among Thieves, which is Uncharted 2, and he was the director of Uncharted 3 Drake's Deception. Okay, so I mean, you know, fair enough. It's possible. He's been a naughty dog for a long time. Yeah. Maybe he's just bored and he wants a new challenge. Should have thought that about before we started. I was going to say starting it and then walking away doesn't sound the. But I wonder, you know, if you're the director of a game, I know you've probably got the kind of overview of of how you want it to to go. But um, surely a lot of that is 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 also a lot a lot of other people are involved in that. Well, usually you usually have partnerships. You usually have a creative director and a technical director, somebody responsible for character, story, vision, tone. All that sort of stuff. Then you have a technical guy who's actually there working with the developers, coders, mm. realizing that ambition and helping out from a hardware and software perspective. It's a- um, so it's usually a partnership, which I find interesting. Which is, that's what Drupman Australia had on Last of Us. Mm. Yeah. Um, so I don't really know what's happened here. We it's, don't have any more information. It's probably worth pointing out that there were rumors when Hennig left that um, 
there was, was there was out. tension between yeah. Druckmann and them, but Sony came out and very very strongly said it could just this is the only time we're addressing this because it's crap, but we're not going to have our people's names dragged through the mud. And, Nothing to do with it. And them. it should also be but said, they would say that, wouldn't they? It should also be said, yeah. Richmond, you know, he is leaving to join Riot Games, who's mm. responsible for one of the biggest games in the world. So it's not like he's going just anywhere to get yeah. out. He's going to a, a really interesting job. Yeah, exactly. And Riot's meant to be, have quite an interesting setup internally and how they work. Like, got lots of money as well. Also that. Hmm. So, you know, it could, it, it could just be completely innocuous. Yeah, but and... Naughty Dog aren't exactly on their uppers, are they? But you on never know, because Uncharted was suddenly... Uncharted was the, you know, the franchise that everyone looked forward to. And then suddenly, what, the former B team releases The Last of Us and every, all eyes are on them. Hmm. So, you know, it could just be the, you know, maybe the pressure of creating a good Uncharted and living up to the Naughty Dog name. That's a lot of pressure when, like, you know, I'm sure Riot, he might be able to do something a bit new. Maybe, he, you know, he's done a lot of Uncharted. Maybe he's just bored of Uncharted. I just said that. Yeah. I'm just repeating what you said, Stu. Because and I'm going to repeat what? what I said earlier on. He, he should have made that decision before he started work on it. Yeah, good check. Anyway. <laughs> okay. Um, good news, if you're a fan good of... News. And you are, Stuart. Oh, yeah. I'm very pleased about this. Frozen, which I may have mentioned. Luke's already switched off. I just, I just I haven't seen it. I don't even care at this stage. You just sing it all the time, and I'm over it. I'm sorry, Stu. Why do you not care about it? Because Stuart sings it all the time. I don't sing it all the time. I, I like the Adele design bit. Luke, that was fun. Luke, let it go. Let it go. Okay. Frozen is now officially the highest grossing animated movie of all time. How amazing is that? It's bigger than even Toy Story 3, which was pretty damn large. So Disney have trumped Pixar. Yes. Even though they own Even Pixar. though they now own them. Yeah, but do you know what I mean? For a long time within Disney animation, Pixar was revered as the golden child and the chosen one. The sal- the, you know, the saviour the, the, the the savior of Disney. Of and um, But now Disney have got back on track and making films every bit, if not better, than Pixar are producing. Mm-hmm. So Lasseter effect, perhaps? It does sound like that, that way, doesn't it? Maybe that's too easy a narrative to project upon yeah. the recent fortunes of Disney Animation Studios. Maybe Welcome to the IGN UK podcast. Got the Disney podcast. Uh, so let's have a look at this. So also, $398.4 million at uh, the US box office and nearly double that, $674 million internationally. It's also one of the biggest uh, pre-sales, pre-sales of uh, Blu-rays and DVDs in the last decade. But do you, do you it? say it's also the top 10 grossing movies of all time? Yes. Yeah. And also, it's the only um, film in that top 10. Which isn't. Isn't a sequel or, or directed, directed by, by James Cameron. There you go. Really? Yeah. What a depressing thought that is. James Cameron, really? Yeah. Wow. Oh, is in so so all the top ten grossing movies of all time. The sequels all directed by James yeah. Cameron. They're not all directed by James no, no. Cameron because <laughs> I was like, that would make me want to kill Although myself. Probably quite a few of them are. Yeah. yeah. Uh, wow. Well, there you go. So uh, also a couple of other is facts. That, can I just it's, say, is that had, out on? Um, I feel it might be on Apple TV or iTunes for download. Is that I out this week? I Think it is. It's out on Blu-ray this week. It's oh, out on must be. DVD, so, so it probably is on iTunes. You know what? Day, I will it? watch it, and we will yeah. discuss it next Monday. I kind of wish we could watch it together. Do you? Snuggled well, up on a sofa under a blanket. Well, let's see what we can work yeah, out. Yeah. That sounds like a uh, It's also, it stayed in the US top 10 for 16 weeks, which no film has achieved since 2002, over, over Crazy. a decade ago. This is, it's it's truly a pop culture phenomenon. I need to see, I do need to see it. Yeah, you do need to see it. I don't, you do need to see You're it. way out of step here. I, I really wanted to go see it, and then I couldn't find anyone to go with. And then you kept taking your stupid I, daughter. Oh, and I, fucking and hell. I was like, why are you taking her rather than, you know, <laughs> me? Like, you could have come with. Well, prioritise. I'm, not, we, I'm not sharing you, Because Stu. we do go to the Saturday morning kids shows. You would have got in for a pound fifty. Yeah, I'm not sharing you, so you can just get that idea out of your filthy head. Unbelievable. Anyway, back on track. So, delighted to say, well, congratulations to Frozen. I'm looking forward to, to the Broadway show when it's uh, when yes. it's released as well. Do we know if there's going to be a West End transfer yet? Or is that Bound too to soon? To, yeah. Bound to be. You would hope, wouldn't yeah. you? You would. I would. I do. <laughs> you would, wouldn't you? I am. There's no fooling you. One of my friends who is actually quite I just a lined up a segue there. I said, there's no fooling you. And oh, okay. We'll come back to that. But one of my <laughs> friends who is actually um, quite a successful West End actor sang, and a man, he sang Let It Go in, his, in an audition the other day. Really? Yeah. But you can, not, you can drop a name. Come on. Uh, uh, well, it's, an, it's a guy called Stuart Clark. I went to university with him. He's a very nice guy. Stuart Clark? Mm. As Never heard the, of him. He's the son uh. of Paul Clarkson, who you re- do someone retweeted the other day. He's, he, but he's dropped the sun. He's dropped the sun from his He nose. has, yeah. D- he, ironically, despite the fact that he is the son, son of. of. Here's some good news. Mm. Uh, that there alien isolation, yeah. of which we have seen and loved and I'm very excited about, has got a release date. 
Now, if you're lucky enough to own a PlayStation 4, an Xbox One, a PlayStation 3, an Xbox 360, or a personal computer with fairly modernized specification, you'll be able to play Alien Isolation from the 7th of October. That's according to Sega, which is great news, isn't it? Are you excited about Alien Isolation? Because you've played yes, a bit. Yes, I am very much indeed. Luke? Hi. Have you played any of it? I haven't, but I don't know if I'm that excited about it because I'm not very good with scary things. Right, okay. I get a little bit, you know, I get scared of my own shadow, really. Mm. So Now, you've, you've heard about it, of course, and the, the idea is that they're, they're basically taking the essence of what made the 1975 Ridley Scott Alien movie so... Yes. Which I have frankly seen. Frankly terrifying and fantastic. And they've, they've distilled it into this slightly larger area. So it's not just going to be on board the Nostromo. It's a, it's a much larger area that you play. Once again, though, there is only one xenomorph, as in the original movie. As opposed so to not, colonial a, marines. Yeah, so you're, Let's not, not face it, you're not going to be gunning down hordes of the buggers. And, you know, the chances are it's going to kill you and you're not going to kill it. Hmm. So it's going to be exceptionally lifelike. And, of course, we've got all these brilliant late 70s-looking gadgets as well. So there's no flat-screen plasma TVs. It's all CRT and a bit mm. a bit crummy-looking, but crummy in a brilliant way. Yep. Not crummy in a we-didn't-bother-taking-any-time-over-these-graphics kind of way. So I'm very excited. I'm stoked, uh, as I believe our US colleagues would possibly say. Yes. It's led me to think, Yeah. what is the scariest video game you've played thus far? Oh, gosh. Because you just said you're scared of video. You're scared of your own shadow. Yeah, of game. Of which mm. game? Come back to me. I mean, I've got a film that doesn't... Should we start with films then? Yeah. Well, I've got... A, I'm, I'm more like psychological thrillers I'm slightly better with. Right. So there's a film that I found absolutely horrifying, which someone else said, called Wolf Creek. Oh, Wolf my Creek? God. It's fantastic. See, right. You like it. Yeah. I watched it, and there's a bit in it where um, he basically... Sever someone's spinal cord, Head right? on a stick. Head on a stick. Yeah. And I watched that, and it just made me feel absolutely nauseous. And I was just like, that is grim. Um, in a very, very similar way, very, very weirdly, um, in The Matrix, when they're all getting killed, in the first Matrix, when they're put, he pulls, that cypher guy, pulls the wires out of the back of their head, and they all just drop down, nothing wrong with them, like kind of... So there's something to do with, like, brain aneurysms, nothing mm. supposedly wrong with you, but you are completely, completely broken. That freaks me out. So... Wolf Creek freaked me out anyway, but then I showed it to all my friends, and I think I overhyped it, and they were just like, this is the worst thing ever. But it is really? very much... Wolf, but Wolf Creek, is, I think, is a, an inherently depressing film as well, because yeah. it's, it is so horrific, and it's, I think, <coughs> never mind all these kind of, you know, uh, all, the, all these kind of torture porn movies, I, I think when there's a film where, where just one person is an inherently evil person, and that comes across... Mm. That's the stuff that can, as I get older, that depresses, that, that, that upsets and depresses me a lot more than, than, than films used to. Especially when it doesn't go too far because he is believable in, you know, it's, it's believable that he is just psychotic rather than just kind of this complete, completely nihilistic weirdo just kind of, you know, which I think can go too far. But I think he, it's very well done in Wolf Creek. He comes across as just being a bit bored and looking for kicks. That's the scary yeah. thing. A complete not a sadist. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Wolf Creek I like as films. I like his films. I like his films, yes. Wolf Creek. I was thinking about, uh, and this is the one I always come back to, because mm. there's just something about it that makes the hairs on the back of your neck stand up, and that's the Robert Wise version of The Haunting from 1963, mm. which is this incredible widescreen, black and white, scary movie. And it's not scary because of anything that really happens. It's scary because of things that don't happen. And it's what's unusual about... So what's unusual insofar as you don't get it anymore is that the film breathes it gives, there are moments of, of quietness and there are moments where the camera just lingers for maybe half a second or a second too long on a scene and you're thinking oh did I just did something mm. yeah. or was that was my it, imagination and a lot of that say like if you go back to the source material the Shirley Jackson novel The Haunting of Hill House which is uh, it's the term in literature is fantastic. Yeah. So it's a piece of literature that's perfectly poised between a totally rational explanation, i.e. there are no ghosts, everything you've imagined is totally in your head, it's in the character's mind, or the other resolution is something does objectively exist that is supernatural. And I think what The, um, the Haunting of Hill House and The Haunting does is it's perfectly poised between those two resolutions so you never know what you're seeing whether it is filtered through the mind of the lead character and they are inherently unreliable it's like the turn of the screw or the um innocence yeah. so you don't know whether i don't know the, usually in these victorian novels it's the female protagonist and she's suffering from some kind of hysteria <laughs> because of course she is she's yeah, a woman she's, yeah also hysteria <laughs> derived um, from the word um meaning womb yeah 
hist whatever yeah hysterectomy hence all that <laughs> well done luke thanks <laughs> That's Luke's some knowledge of the female form there. Yeah. Um, well done. But I think that's why it's really scary because it's the, it's the ambiguity. That's why I take anti And also, both resolutions are scary in their own rights. One is ghosts actually do exist, which, blimey Charlie, it's pretty scary. Or you're suffering from mental illness, which actually is, is probably it, scarier. Is that one antihistamine is it keeps women away? It's yes. like a woman repellent. I thought so. Works quite well, doesn't it? Yeah. I've Remarkably. I've been on them all my life. <laughs> What about you, film-wise? Good. Um, Wise film, Probably, I think Halloween still. Really? I think the original John Carpenter ha- version like, of yeah, Halloween. No, you I think there's something profoundly scary about someone just standing there watching you. Mm. Even in the middle of the day when he's stalking Laurie um, through the early part of the film. And she's in she's in English class and she's been taught Hamlet. And she looks out the window and he's just stood there from across the street. Mm. Or when she's walking down the street and he just pops out from the side of the hedge. Yeah. And just watches her with a kind of inhuman patience that he'll stand there all day long. He wants to kill her, but he'll, he'll wait. And that's terrifying. That's absolutely terrifying. And it reminds me of the anecdote that inspired um, Wes Craven to make uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. Do you know this story? No. So uh, one night when Wes Craven was like, I don't know, 10, 12 or something, he looked out of his bedroom window and he saw this like old drunk like underneath the street lamp and he's wearing a red and green sweater like Freddy Krueger and he just stood there and you know obviously he ducked away from the curtains hid and then he looked back through through a crack in the curtains and the guy was still stood there looking up at him and started to laugh and this is an old like middle-aged drunkard man and he's doing it to torment a little child and Wes Craven's like that thought just like terrified me this quite quite an evil sensibility and that's why I think Freddy Krueger has that kind of little bit of kind of maniacal glee to him like he quite likes being funny with being evil mm. um, so I think it's something about that being watched but the person when you see them watching you they don't flinch they yeah. don't care they're happy for you to know that you're what they're watching you um, I think that's why Halloween in particular still kind of stays with me. And that's why in terms of going back onto games, maybe, uh, even though it's not a great game, it's a great experience. When we played Slender for the first time sure. in the office a couple of yeah, years ago, same sort of thing. You turn around and there's someone in the distance just there. Yeah, They're not going to jump out at you. They're not going to say boo. They're not going to like have a face that bleeds mm. or their eyes pop out of their heads or tentacles or something incredibly outlandish and elaborate. They're just going to wait. And they'll get closer. (laughs) Yeah. That freaks me out. There's something to be said about the banality of evil as well, I think. Well, Fred and Rosemary West. Yeah, exactly. I know it sounds ridiculous to bring up Fred and Rosemary West, but it's true. When you read about Fred and Rosemary West, like, ostensibly, so incredibly quaint, but terrifying. Mm. Yeah. There's a, there's a, obviously there's a, there's a, there's a film loosely based on, on Fred and Rose West, which is Mum and Dad, Mm. which is a a really well put together British horror movie about what happens to, to this girl who is taken back to the to this uh, what just looks like a normal um, semi-detached house near near Heathrow, but then there's another film as well which I saw recently called Tony. Okay, and it's just about this guy. It's a We're still in the low, title, isn't it? Yeah, it's called that Tony, title. and he's just this bloke, and he lives on his own in in kind of northeast London, and he's just got these big kind of glasses on and this horrible little pencil moustache and he's just you wouldn't th- th- this is the brilliant thing you wouldn't even notice him walking along the street you wouldn't notice him and it's not and this film plays it really cool and he goes and he gets his milk from the the, the, the local shop and he takes it home and in the little blue carrier bag and he gets there and then suddenly you're aware of this like buzzing noise and you realize that there are flies buzzing around and the reason for that is he's just got a corpse mm. in bed with him of a, of a guy that he met and took back to his house and just slaughtered him, just really casually killed him. This is based on anything. No, it's yeah. it's 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 but it's obviously fiction, but bears it's very strong resemblances to like things like Dharma Den- and Eggy and, and people Gein. like that. But Gein is also the one, and Gein is kind of like the primal trauma for all American cinema, mm. like Psycho, Texas Chainsaw, Silence of the Lambs, all comes from Gein because he was this kind of simpleton in a in a village. I think was it Arkansas, somewhere like that, or Wisconsin, and. People used to like trust him to look after their kids, mm. and he used to like eat out of cereal bowls that were made out of people's skulls. So again, it's the banality of evil. Um, 
God, how do we get into here? <laughs> We've got Taking it all in, Fred and Rose, like, West Ed Gain. Yeah, horror is tangent. Of, well, this thing horror's my, like not for me. I mean, I read Edgar Allan Poe, so like the whole Imp of the Perverse, the whole Telltale Heart thing. Like you know, yeah. when you were mentioning that, that but watching that's quite high kind of baroque gothic. Yeah, like I'm fine with that. Of... That's absolutely fine. I can handle that kind of stuff. Uh, but I guess black... it's more kind of realistic horror that you have, have an issue with, is it? Well, I don't know. I mean, there's <coughs> elements of like. Um, the what should we call it of Poe that got me like you know the kind of whole, the imp of the perverse you know doing the wrong thing no for no rhyme nor reason it's just because it's the wrong thing and there's mm. just that that innate curiosity in you where you're like oh well you know what maybe I'd just like to see what happens um, I think I think what games can do in particular mm. above and beyond films is they can make you experience fear in a very kind of real way like even though I said ha- find Halloween very kind of unnerving. I don't think there's any film that really, really scares me in the same way that a game is still capable mm, of scaring absolutely. me. I remember, I remember playing Fear on the PC yeah. years ago, uh, and and being genuinely creeped out, but by um, and feeling my heart absolutely pounding because you are experiencing it. It's yeah. you're not. You're not, it's not a second-hand experience of some director who's put this up on a screen. Yeah, you are actually controlling where you yeah. go and what you do. Even and I think the, that's why it's more of a connection. Because even though I think um, a lot of horror cinema, a lot of slasher movies of the '80s, but going back to Peeping Tom, use first-person perspectives quite interestingly. And I think there's interesting parallels to draw between films and games in that respect. <laughs> that horror is a is a genre of filmmaking that likes using first-person perspective, but usually to identify you with the killer. Mm. to put you in some kind of collusion with the killer that you're the one stalking whereas in games you tend to be the hunted yes. I'm thinking things like Slender obviously but then in other games like Condemned I found Condemned it was one of my first 360 games actually and I played it around my cousin's house and he didn't prepare me for what it was oh, I was God. staying over the night and turned all the lights out and he's passed me the controller and I was in this kind of derelict um, tenement block in New York and you're just walking around and like there's drug addicts off their face chasing you around in the dark and you don't have any weapons you have to like beat them to death with your hands and there's another bit where you put me on you skip me forward and you're in a vacated uh, department store and there's loads of mannequins around the place and oh well, midway through the level in the corner of your eye you see one of these mannequins begins to move uh, and starts chasing you that's terrifying that's terrifying and I can, while I can imagine that being a film I don't think I'd have the same response no. because it's not coming for you there's still a degree of detachment i mean um, the, the only game that i kind of have which isn't even a horror game was when i was quite young playing uh morrowind which is the third yeah. elder scrolls game and i i was in in a cave so it was dark anyway and you can i was trying to get to you know trying to get to the end seeing what was there but it's one of those things of like as you say it's a completely different thing i was i knew that i didn't have enough health to be in there i was you know pitching above my weight if anything saw me i couldn't really win in a fight so you know i'm desperately trying to get through that you know get to where i need to go get the stuff i need and get out um and yeah i just remember turning a corner and thinking oh god i've made it and quickly running over to like grab the item i need spinning around again and this massive, massive, this creature called an ogrim, which is like a big kind of bulky thing, was just there. And I screamed like a child. I mean, I was a child. I was like 10. But like, that's not a reaction I've ever had from from film. Like, I kind of get... I've seen the woman in black stage play, which I found mm. quite freaky. Yeah. Um, I haven't but that's because once again... It's the, it's the unknown for me rather and, than anything. And also something like the woman in black, you're, it's there. It's there in front of you. There mm. is no kind of artificial screen. Because um, mm. I think the woman in black, it's is it performed in the round? Uh, no, I mean you you end on, but the thing is she <laughs> she 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 comes into the audience, yeah, which first of all yeah. breaks that kind Bit of, of traditional spoiler. yeah that breaks that traditional audience stage relationships. There's, there's no safety, and also um, that you make good use of gauzes, so where you think yes. there's about you know fake backs everywhere, yeah. so you think oh I'm fine, and then suddenly you're like boom she's there. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's um it's pretty pretty scary. <laughs> I think this is a good one to throw open to the uh, listeners, actually, mm. Uh, mm. to find out what people think is the scariest game or scariest movie that yeah. they've experienced. And there's, I mean, it's worth saying there's loads of games we haven't ne- name checked that, you know, Resident Evil, um, yeah. Silent Hill, Eternal Darkness, Dead and even Space. Even ones like, as I say, Morrowind, sort of that's not particularly scary, yeah. but you may have just, it may have freaked you out. And I do think a trend this year is kind of a resurgence in horror games. Like, I think the last few years, obviously, shooters have been a genre that have kind of thrived and bloomed and now maybe slightly wilting. I, I think is horror that... is something that, big, you know, it's thriving on the indie scene. I was gonna and say, I think it's... if Alien does well, I, Alien Isolation, 
then you might see that becoming more and more viable at AAA kind of level. I think because so many are kind of going on to PS Plus as well, right? Especially PS4 launch up like Atlas, Atlas, Atlas and all that. Is terrifying. You know, so I think that's opened the door for a lot more people. Yeah. With PS Plus. So, so how can people get in touch too? Oh, they can send it in via Caro Pigeon. Good. Good. Or, or or they could write to us on that catchy the, email address. Yes, IGN underscore UK feedback at IGN.com. Are we doing something about that? I uh, just uh, uh, eventually. No. eventually. We embed we embedded at the bottom of the story eventually. and it's kind of like uh, uh people have been getting in touch with us. They have, yeah. Right, so shall I kick off? Martin you normally Cro do. Hey, Martin Cross says, Hi there, I've been reading IGN for years. It was my first go-to for game industry news. But I've often wondered, what web websites did you start reading first? Are there any competitor sites you still love now? Thank you. Anyone want to go first or shall I kick no, off? No, I don't, I don't really use the internet. Good, good. Um, I quite like reading Eurogamer. I think Eurogamer have um, very insightful articles. They're a little bit too long for me. Um, just in the sense that I don't have that attention TLDR. span. TLDR. <laughs> TLDR. So that's, that's just even a news story. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> nah. I was like, nah, not for me. So no, I, 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 use, I read them because they're very insightful features, so it's quite useful to get ideas for your own starting point. Um, other than that, I don't know, I kind of, I came to IGN when I was quite young. Um, and, we, and, the, and we raised you. And you raised me on the board. Oh, I was raised, suckled you. I was raised in the harsh territory of the boards, so um, <laughs> yeah. I've seen things. And then um, I <coughs> basically, the other, the only other ones that I still read today quite regularly, um, you may know I'm quite an MMO fan. So MMO Champion, I used to read WoW Insider, which is, um, and Massively, which are both part of the Joystick Network. Um, and I also worked for Massively for a little bit. So I, I read them because they give me more MMO news. They let me suckle on that delicious teat until I'm full to bursting. Until you're... Absolutely corporal. Oh, Absolutely really need to get corporal. Rid of some of these images. That um, in interesting. Um, I always used to buy when I was a kid. I used to buy two magazines. I used to buy Edge magazine. I used to buy Empire magazine. Oh, I buy I Edge and Games in TM. Yeah, I used to. Yeah, so Edge magazine. I still think, regardless of any kind of genre magazine, it is the nicest looking magazine that you can buy. Yes, it is stunning. Every issue of it is beautiful. Layout on it. Everything. It's an amazing magazine. The writing is, is equally great. Mm. Um, and the iPad edition, if you haven't checked that out, is just unbelievable. Yeah. That's what a digital magazine should be like. The, the front cover is animated. The way that you can scroll through the images. Everything is beautiful. Uh, I think they've done the best kind of leap to iPad. Really embraced it. And think, let's not just put scans of the magazine on an iPad. Mm. Make it truly interactive so it's a pleasure to read on an iPad. Mm. Anyway. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I agree. I, I mean, I buy Edge for the editorials as much as anything. Like, the features that they do are really, really insightful, really kind of clever. Because they also get great access, so they, yeah. they have some great stuff in there. Uh, yeah, so they're definitely worth... Uh, have, and do you? No, no I, don't, I don't... You get you buy... You, you, you I still buy, buy your music. Ma you still buy your music. I buy magazines. I, yeah, I buy what Mo mags? Mojo, Uncut. I used to buy a terrific magazine called The Word which was a really good uh, film and music magazine, which unfortunately um, folded. Uh, and it was, it was really That's good. That's what you want from a magazine. Normally hey. you do. It was almost like a, a kind of <laughs> British indie vanity fair is the only way I could describe it. And it was a really, really well-written, well-put-together magazine. And I still miss it. It, fold, it folded about 18 months ago, and I wish it was still going. because oh, really That's, That's a shame. That's yeah. a shame. Um, and that's kind of it. I used to I used to get all the music weekly music papers yeah. when I was younger. Like, and so that would have been Enemy Sounds Record Mirror. Kerrang! <laughs> that's the only one I never used. When to you went through with. your email phase, yeah, happy days. Should read the voice of IGN News on Kerrang. Yes. <laughs> Hello. Hello. When I remember. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's like I've either left the iron on or I've forgotten to do Kerrang. <laughs> Some days both. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what a team we make. Let's talk about traditional media, such as that television. Hello, IGN UK team, says Cameron Amo... Um, uh, 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 Cameron Amoyles. Uh, Jazz Camoyles is his uh, email name. Jazz Camoyles. <laughs> hmm. Although it's not directly related to the subjects IGN cover, I just wanted to ask for your opinions on the proposed closure of BBC Three that was announced by the BBC a couple of weeks ago. Personally, I despise the fact that I would be considered part of the age group that the channel is aimed at. I've never had any interest in the channel's programming beyond the occasional Doctor Who or Sherlock rerun. However, I still think that the channel should remain. Mm. I disagree with the idea of BBC Three being replaced with an online-only iPlayer-based service, as I believe that the BBC's role as a universal, all-accessible broadcasting agency means that they have an obligation to continue to support tradition 
traditional forms of media, even if the online space is rapidly growing. Um, mm. Interesting. A bit right. of alter there. I, I will not watch your channel, but I will defend your rights broadcast. Yeah, Good, for exactly. them. Good for them. Um, I, I think it's absolutely outrageous that BBC is uh, completely. So what's the? Sorry, I, I've missed out here. Are so they the, still going to? The BBC Three has been taken off television and is going to be an online-only yeah. channel accessible through iPlayer. Arguably, is that is surely they've looked at the data. That's maybe how most of those shows are consumed. I guess. Well, that's a very if interesting I, point. If I ever watch BBC Three, and sometimes I do, like I'll come home, I'll sit on. I, I don't watch TV anymore. I watch all my all BBC stuff through iPlayer. I, yes, and yeah. I, sometimes, if I want to watch some absolute crap, I'll put on a BBC Three documentary. If I want something on in the background while I'm doing something else, I'll watch one of the absolute ridiculous documentaries they make. I watch Family Guy on BBC Three when I'm in bed, and yeah. I watch um, I, Sunset and Suspicious Parents, which is no longer appointment to view television. I hasten to add, it's gone downhill. Um, and other than that, did Gavin and Stacey start on BBC it Three? It did. BBC I, Three has been a springboard for, for a lot for of comedians, some comedy, yes. right? And, so, li- and Little Britain. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Lest we forget. So I but quite here's like the thing, that. Things like Family Guy. Uh, the chances are that will not be available. It went. It's, it's not an iPlayer. Yeah. Only. It's, they never exactly. put an iPlayer. They don't yeah. have the license, do they? <laughs> that, so that's the problem. But you know, if we're we're talking about BBC Three, it, it, it would be to my mind, it would be like the BBC getting rid of Radio One. Yeah. It just, just getting to a point we're saying right if you're under 25 we are simply not interested we don't care about you which is crazy because uh, if they if they if they decide that a demographic uh, is is not for them uh, how is that demographic supposed to then get on the next rung of it, no, is that right not what, are they not saying they're going to make it unavailable in the way that that demographic primarily consumes it so therefore save the expenditure of broadcasting it because all the people who actually enjoy that stuff are consuming it online. That does make more sense when you consider the fact that's probably why they haven't done it with BBC4, right? Because if they're you not, like, take the my, ma- an iPad near my like mouth, yeah, BBC4 should they, is not safe. The BBC, major they, expense... They've, said that, they've not said that BBC4 is safe. In fact, they said the opposite. They said that we are still looking at cutbacks. BBC4 is not immune from these cutbacks. Like the major expense mm. is surely producing the shows, which yeah. they're not stopping. So they still they are still catering for that audience. They're just doing doing it in a more targeted way and not wasting the money on the broadcast which no one's watching I guess I yeah, guess that's what I'm inferring it isn't, in, in the general scheme of things broadcasting it isn't the major, major expense oh, do you thought, I don't know how much that would cost though like surely keeping that running every single day like it's, it's about 50 million a year which, is, which in the scheme of things isn't actually a massive amount of money for the BBC I guess but if everyone's watching the shows elsewhere mm. it is probably a bigger expense that you could save for instance mm. say something like 80% of BBC3 shows are consumed via iPlayer then if you were a bookkeeper at BBC you'd probably go move that all online I don't know I'm playing devil's advocate so what I happens think, yeah. I mean are we getting to the stage where live television is is an anachronism I, I've started watching live TV since I moved to London gradually more and more like I got a huge I got a really great 40 inch Samsung TV a couple of years ago when I broke my leg I thought I need to invest in the television I'm going to be at home for a bit yeah and I've never watched live TV on it. I mean, I, I watch... Or through my laptop, because you still get live TV through your laptop yeah. sometimes. I mean, I watch some live TV, but to be honest, by the time I'm, do- I'm done doing all the chores I need to do and everything after work, I mean, I'm not ready to actually sit down and watch anything until about 9.30, at mm-hmm. which stage, you know, most things start at 9 or something, so I've missed half of it. So then I just think, oh, never mind, I'll record it tonight and I'll watch it tomorrow. Mm. I have to agree. I just don't have time, really. I find that most of the time now, it's Netflix or iPlay. Or download yeah. a bit of iPlay to your phone, watch it on the tube, and yeah. you commute in. Mm. There are very few things that you need to watch live. And, and, and sport, you know, like, honestly, sport and stuff like that are one of the few things that you do have to watch live. Well, it's, it's the Netflix model, isn't it? Like, in the sense of why they were like with House of Cards, <coughs> we're going to release it all in one <coughs> fell swoop because people don't sit and watch episodes. You know, they stock it up and you have a binge on like a weekend. And that's kind of what I'm doing with Game of Thrones season three. Like, right. I've read the book, so I know what happens and everything, but I'm watching it all now, right before season four kicks off. I wish iPlayer was as good as Netflix, though. In, in in the kind of speed and the quality. I wish, you know, when you stream something live from the BBC, like yeah. watch live from ITV or BBC, it was in HD. Mm. Like mm. They figure out the compression algorithm or whatever it is. My, my, I don't understand why it's not in HD. I play, I play is quite good on my PS3 and PS4 streaming using the apps. Yeah. I don't have any issues there. Yeah. And 4OD has gotten better. 4OD used to be really terrible. I, ITV plays crap. Yeah. yeah. That's not in HD at all. No. But and you have to sign up. To yeah, use that's it. crazy. It oh. just seems like they've ported it over rather well, even, than actually. Even on the Samsung? From, na- from now on, yeah. I really? think they brought it in recently. That's shocking. So I watched The Widower the other night. It's very good, but. Who's in that? Reese Shearsmith. Oh. Ooh. Yeah. 
Uh, next bit of feedback is from Royce Butler. Um, I'm not really sure what you mean here, um, Royce. I'll just read it out loud and see if we can work out. Um, um, do you guys think PS4 will ever receive games from the backlog as the PS Plus freebies? Thus far, every game offered has been free at its release on the system, which is pretty remarkable. Do you think he means older games that were way back on PS Plus in the past? He either means that, or I think he... I don't know if he means... Sorry, Royce, so, if I'm not understanding. Does he mean PS4 release titles that have come so out on physical disc? I kind of think that, because I think what he's saying is that, you know, we oh, had, yeah, we had um, forward, Outlast, yeah. and then we had Contrast, and then we had Mercy, so the more the kind of Mercy like Kings. like the lighter titles, and arguably. This thing, they, the indie right, titles that you. kind of are released as part of PS Plus, and then after the month, they become... Yeah. You can buy them, you don't... They're not available, and then it's announced that they're part of PS right, Plus. Right, so, so I think that is me? what Royce is meaning. Yeah. Um, I think... I think ultimately in the long run, they're just not going to can- cannibalize sales of those launch yeah. games for a long while. But I would argue but this probably is really, like, probably this nine is, months. But surely a year. this is a really, really good thing, right? So they're not doing that whole thing of like they could have released Mercenary Kings last month and been like, you know, let a whole group of people desperate for a new game buy it and then be like, oh, did we not tell you? Oh, sorry, we're going to put it on PS Plus. So it could have been free. Yeah. You could have saved your money. They're literally introducing it and they're saying, right. It's going to be here and it's going to be free for the first month it's on there. And then after that, we're going to charge you for it. So yeah. if you want to try it out, try it out now. Yeah. So surely that's the better way and, to do it. And also, it, from Sony's perspective, like wrangling the economics of this and the rights, it's probably easier to pay the developer of Don't Star for a month of exclusivity than going, hey, Infamous. Yeah. Which obviously not going to do because that's a system seller. Yeah. Um, in the so. long run, in a year's time, totally. Because PS Plus is a service that I think survives on being kind of revered as a really brilliant deal yeah and i think they want to be protective of keeping that going that everyone looks at that service goes that's a killer service yeah okay cool so then i've got one from uh damien huxtable who says hi guys damien here from cardiff just wanted to see uh to play devil's advocate regarding spoilers particularly after the last episode um i don't know if this is a superhero show when i uh it is um last week's podcast so again we should just say a little spoiler warning a little spoiler for for the arkham games um so krupa pointed out that the joker um sadly passes away in the arkham games sorry and stated if you've not played arkham city it came out three years ago so what are you waiting for Another unrelated yeah. argument used frequently to defend violent games is the parents should be monitoring more closely. So, if this ch- if a child is 10 when Arkham City comes out, three years later he's only 13 and is still too young to play the 15-rated game. Um, his parents monitor what he plays closely, as often requested by video game representatives, and so he has now had the game spoiled through no fault of his own. Interested to hear your take on this. Keep up the good work. Oh, boo-hoo. So you're <laughs> young. Get over I d- yourself. I just... Uh, <laughs> I think it comes to the problem with spoilers in general. I think we live, especially on the internet, in very spoilerific, spoilerphobic times. But we've talked about this before, and we, and like, we th- I think we've gotten a lot better. I've even written something about spoilerphobia yeah. for the site. It's that like everyone just overreacts. And I yeah. t- like, but also I, I sympathise, because I wouldn't want certain things spoilt for me at all. Like mm. I wouldn't want season three of Game of Thrones spoiled for me. I would have that would have really upset me and ruined the show. But I think there has to be a moratorium on when you can and can't totally speak agree. about things. Otherwise, you're just infinitely deferring the conversation and then you never get around to discussing anything. It, yeah. And do you know what? Something else is going to come along that you can be part of. Because yeah. that's life. Yeah. Mm. It's, uh, the worst is when you write something about like a novel or something or Sherlock Holmes, people got spoiler. It's like, it's been out for over 100 years. Yeah. Like, Yeah. <clears throat> well, I mean, my thing is I have successfully managed to keep... The Game of Thrones season three spoilers from my flatmate for well since they happened last year, and so I'm quite proud of that. And I'm now gonna you've sh- kept them from him. Yeah. Okay. So you know I've kept it going. Yeah, I've kept the mystery, which is you'll I, probably make it now. I well I hope so, but I probably, I assume probably, with it launching next week yeah, there's going to be wrap stuff, ups. Well, I've seen a couple of things on Reddit referring to the events. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. So I, I, get I think what he's there saying. needs to, I think it needs to be enough now we can talk about it but I, I sympathize obviously nobody wants anything spoiled but you have to discuss things sometimes yeah it's different i yeah i think if you know you've seen something you don't go straight on social media and say that mm. or like yeah be sensitive yeah but- i mean i've got quite a few group chats with friends on my phone and like i just kind of drop into that did you guys see this and then you know people can either flag an interest or not and then we chat or we don't jimmy can you come in here yes mummy it's about daddy he's not your real father Spoiler alert, Mum! I know. Can you imagine? Yeah. But in, interesting that you said Jimmy, because he used Jimmy in the thing, and I See said you, child. Jimmy. Get that, Gilbert Botham. Brilliant name. That actually sounds like a Viz character. Gilbert Botham. Brilliant. Brilliant. Hey, and he's from Chicago. He won't know what Viz is. <laughs> he might. Be. I don't know what Viz Quite is. Important. What is Viz? You know what, what Viz is? is? No. What's Viz? 
I feel old now. Wow. What was Viz? Not as old as you. We'll explain on off off podcast. No, we won't explain. Viz is like a, an adult comic, full of Viz. full of ridiculous characters and. Uh, is it slightly smutty? Mm, yeah, yeah, a little bit. But like classy smut? No, not not classy at all. You would never level classiness at Viz. Okay. Yeah. So just smut. Buster Gonad and his unfeasibly large testicles was one character. <laughs> I'm trying to think of the others. Um, what was the one that you just said? Oh, uh, and Johnny Fart Pants. Okay, and who? Yeah. what is this guy's name? The Fat Slags. This is Gilbert Botham. The, oh, the Fat Slag. Okay, good. Well, I feel I've learned something. Hey, guys, he says, do you think that the layoffs at the Sony Worldwide Studios in the UK are worrisome? It seems that there's been a lot of layoffs from a lot of these studios. I also love the podcast. Keep it up. Thank we, you. We kind of touched you. on this earlier, right? Touch what? <sighs> Each other. Um, we did kind of touch on this earlier with the Naughty Dog thing, right? Mm. Um, so, yeah, I, I wouldn't be... I'm not particularly concerned. Well, Sony's pitching it as development cycles, right? So when you start a project, you need a lot of development uh, muscle behind a project. Then you get it out the door and you're like, hey, okay, now we can We don't need like, all these idiots yeah, exactly. anymore. All of you, take a hike. Yeah, we're back at the des- design stage. So everyone gets out yeah. and then you rehire people. But I don't know if that's necessarily true because a lot of these games seem to... There's layoffs at Evolution and Drive Club is very much in full-on development at the moment uh it was gorilla cambridge who were meant to be working on a game i think for ps4 they were the guys who did killzone mercenary for mercenary for um vita and they have been meant to be working on a title for a while and then sce london which was the one who did playroom or is it playroom yeah that's mm-hmm. the free to play mm-hmm. camera stuff on ps4 they also had um layoffs and again that seems that was about six months ago so mm. would they only be doing layoffs now i mean it's right before the end of the financial year so it might just be them trimming the fat, as it were, no disrespect, but, you know, they have... Sony, Sony uh, as a company, not the games division, but as a company, Sony is, you know, still not yeah. exactly... In the best of shape. No, it's, no. there's still stuff that needs to be done. This reorganising over time, I think. Yeah. I'm not... I wouldn't... Don't ring any alarm bells it. yet. Yeah. <coughs> no, don't bother ringing any bells. <laughs> I mean, this is the other thing as well. Sony is in a very fortunate position that it has so many first-party studios, right? So if it decides to do layoffs at several of them to... My, you know to keep an eye on the bottom Gil, line I hope that's answered your question I'm going to stop Luke talking because he's just banging on uh, IGN Good. underscore UK feedback at IGN.com is the address to get in touch with us at to with and on yes out this week Luke Carmali games are coming out uh, yeah they are so we have two games this week uh, Dynasty Warriors 8 Extreme Legends mm. which is a thing um, and then also The Elder Scrolls Online which I'm already playing and enjoying a lot and if you want to play with me I am on the EU mega server so is there a name what do we have well yeah i mean you, i'm neeland so it's n double e l a h n if you want to play with me just hook me up or hit me up hook, hook up your hit ups hook up hit, my hit hit up so what? yeah i'm uh, but yeah it's very good um and our review should be our review should be live before too long our review in progress is already up i believe it is indeed yes so yes don't it, believe yeah it's good isn't goat simulator out this week as well it is it's not on that list but goat simulator mm. is out and we gave it an eight out of ten because it's apparently very Hilarious. satirical and funny mm. embraces bugs yeah, game breaking bugs and the kind of ridiculousness of physics engines gone awry. Yeah, it's I'm like, pleased about this, mm. but I hope it's not going to start a spate of these kind of non-game games. Do you know what I mean? The, the gag's been done now. Yeah, let's, leave it alone. Yeah, let's not do it again. Okay, it won't be as funny. No. Okay. All right. Okay. Stuart. Thank God that didn't happen with Flappy Bird, right, or anything like that, or something like that. Yeah. There are films coming out this week as well at, in the cinemas. There is. Uh, did, we, them, did we say Dynasty Warriors as well? Yeah, we did. Yeah. But we didn't really talk about oh, it. Okay. Dynasty Warriors 8 Extreme Legends. I feel that's a special Catchy. version of it. I think Dynasty yeah, Warriors 8 already out. It came out last year yeah. um, on Xbox and PS3. I feel, no, I, it's have on PS4, yeah. I feel I have it, but I don't actually remember much about it. Good. Luke no. reviewed it. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing scenes. I didn't. The first film uh, is uh, Noah. Getting biblical. Isn't it, eh? Well, not really. Uh, it's biblical. Kind of like it takes, it takes biblical. a Bible story as its kind of jumping off point. And no, then, but like I said to you, a man it embraces, and Emma Watson. No, 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 no. <laughs> like I said, it embraces a lot of other um, <laughs> scripture and non-canonical biblical texts. This ain't no King James, is it? No, it isn't. No, but then the original Bible was no King James. <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> um, so it does. It is based on various kind of Jewish texts and stuff for some of the weirder stuff in the film. Mm. But what I would say, if you've seen the trailer of the poster for Noah, the final film is nothing like that poster trailer makes out. No, it's it, a lot it, longer. It's taken <laughs> all of the kind of weirder stuff that's in that film out of it. It's made it look like, like a fairly Passion of the Christ. straightforward made drama. It, made it look like Passion of the Christ yeah. because you know what? That will bring in a lot of... It'll bring in the religious 
religious pound. What religious Chris green banks. Green backs. You know, there's the grey pound. Yeah. yeah. What was it like? The religious pound or something. The, the papal pound. The papal pound. There Very go. good. There you go. Um, the Protestant pound. No. No. Um, Catholic quid. I said the Catholic coin. But there's loads of Catholic weird stuff coin, in there. Good. There's yeah. loads of weird, yeah. interesting stuff in there. The Church of England, Bank of England. Back on track. Holy Hundreds. The Double is out. Richard Ayoade's, uh film based on a Dostoevsky novel. Yes. Fyodor Mikhailovich Dostoevsky. Um, it's Eucharistic off, Euros. Off. Sorry. I'm done. <laughs> yeah, this is going to work well as a cutout. <laughs> yeah. It's very good. The Double is very good. It's got that fella in it who's the miserable Jesse fella. Eisenberg. That's the one, yeah. He's in it, but he's very good in this. He plays himself. And he That's also, unusual for him. And he also plays not himself. Oh, you see, it's all about a man one. whose life is turned upside down when an identical man to him comes into his life. Not his twin? No. Oh, I thought no. I'd just figured out a spoiler. No, oh, well. Absolutely we not. Uh, and it's really good. If you, like, if you like good Terry Gilliam movies, you'll like this. Okay. And if, if you like bad Terry Gilliam movies, you'll probably like this. <laughs> cool. So yeah. everyone covered then. Everybody. And Rio 2 is out. The eagerly awaited sequel. Has it got Johnny Depp in it? Am I making that up? I think you're, I think making, you're that making that up. up. <laughs> you're thinking of Rango, aren't you? Yeah, I am thinking yeah. of Rango. Yeah. No, this has got one of them from uh, Flight of the Concords that doesn't write the songs for the Muppet movie. Oh, so the good one. Yeah. Is it Jermaine? Um, yeah, so... Yeah. This don't, has don't bother seeing This that. also has Jesse Eisenberg in. Does it? <laughs> yes, it does. Wow. Jamie Foxx, Andy Garcia. Oh, I know Andy Garcia. Kristen yeah, Chenoweth. Um, Kristen who? Kristen Chenoweth. She was, she uh, was the in, original Glinda in Wicked. Was, and in, in West Wing. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Oh, but oh, real two. Good. If you're going to go see that, you probably don't need any convincing. No, probably no. not. Go cool. see the double, though. I'd like to know what everybody thinks of it. Okay. You might think it's really boring. And what can? how do they let us know? Do email us. At... Oh, don't do that. IGN underscore UK feedback at IGN.com. Yeah. All right. Good. And on that note, uh, uh, we are going to disappear up our own orifices uh, because we've got work to do to bring you more exciting stuff on the website. Uh, yeah. So until next week, thank you so much for listening. And if you've been watching, thank you so much for watching as well. We will see you. Some of us will see you. Some of us might not see you. It might be all of us. It might be none of us. Next week. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. <laughs>